Chris, thanks for sitting with me today. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Um, so I, I told you very briefly on the phone what we were doing. Um, just to recap, uh, so I'm an ambassador for a neighborhood program called Park Bench. Mm -hmm. um, and what we do is we go out and we meet with uh, business owners in the neighborhood and then business owners who service the neighborhood. Great. Um, just to get to know them so they can get to know us. And so we can promote you online and to our 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 uh, roster of clients and, 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 and the neighborhood in general. Um, so just to start officially, your name is Christopher A. Case, it otherwise is. known as Chris. Chris. Okay. It's not too hard to remember. That's good. Um, and, uh, and you've recently started a new business. I have. I have. Um, do you want to tell me a little bit about that? So I'm, I've been an insurance broker in the property casualty business for 10 years, and uh, I've recently launched my own brokerage. Fantastic. So Case Insurance Brokers is uh, launched in February. Okay. Uh, so I'm looking forward to being active in the neighborhood and servicing uh, new clients in the Greater Toronto area. So you and I have been working together for a few years. Yep. So I, I know how you work. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously there's a reason I asked to interview you because <laughs> I know you well. I like what you do. Um, could you describe your business a little bit? What, you know, it might sound obvious what an insurance broker does. Maybe you can describe it for people who aren't oh, sure. Oh, sure. And I'm happy to do that. So um, my role is on the property and casualty side. It means that I'm insuring uh, businesses in terms of the their property, their assets, the business activities they're doing, and the liability that they incur in terms of running the business. I'm also involved in uh, helping clients with their home, auto, cottages, all the toys, that motorcycles, they have, all that boats. stuff, scooters, <laughs> you name it, we insure it. Um, so it's basically physical assets that, that I do. Um, and um, what I'm looking to do with this new venture is really to become the entrepreneur's choice for business, auto, and home. So to provide a one stop shopping solution for folks that are looking for uh, great products, excellent advice, and good service. I've been an entrepreneur for myself for more than 20 years, so I know what it's like to be an entrepreneur. Sure. And um, time's tight, and you when you need what you need when you need it. And um, I have, I really enjoy working with those kind of folks. So for me, this is uh, going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward cool. to it. And, and so just to be clear, <clears throat> so somebody who has a, a home insurance policy, yep. which I hope most people do, yeah. uh, whether they are homeowners or tenants, mm -hmm. um, that's residential. If they're an entrepreneur and they have just an, an assistant or, or a salesperson mm -hmm. who works for them um, or a par business partner, um, can't they kind of add something onto their homeowner's policy uh, or is it completely different? It, it depends. Um, uh, so for me as an insurance broker, for a long time, I was a broker, but I didn't own a brokerage. Sure. Um, and what I did is on my package, I could do that. So right. the um, my business contents, you know, my laptop, all that kind of stuff was covered. So if a client came to visit me at home, it didn't happen that often, sure. but in the chance that somebody wanted to come and meet me here um, and something slipped and fell or whatever, and there was some kind of lawsuit, I would be covered. Right. What I wasn't covered for was any of the professional liability that sure. I was incurred and okay. as a professional. Um, and that's where when people are looking to add on an extension to their policy, that's where they can get in trouble. Okay. So if they're a graphic designer or a marketing person or a management consultant or any of those things, right. those kind of situations, the, you know, the standard insurance companies, they don't want to take that liability so right. in those cases those those people uh should have a standalone policy just like i do now gotcha. um it, it, i could still get my filing cabinet covered right. but um and my assets but as far as what i'm doing that's where they have to be careful because that's where the big risks are yeah. for, for an entrepreneur or a solopreneur or anybody working gotcha. at home. cool okay and and uh again i mean i've known you for a while i know the answer to some of these questions but i'll ask them anyways <laughs> um uh what made you get into this business? Why did you choose this? Well, I had been in insurance for a long time and had been an entrepreneur for a long time, but I hadn't dealt on this side. I was in a very uh, niche product working for an insurance company. And uh, I left the company side to become a broker. And once I got into the brokering world, I realized that I really like to help people. Okay. And uh, I basically learned the business, um, you know, sort of, you know, that way, uh, dealing with people, I had this niche specialty, but then I started to broaden out. And what I realized is I like doing the broader stuff more than the niche. Gotcha. So I still do some of that work, um, but primarily I'm dealing with entrepreneurs on their business issues. And I like being active. And the, the reason that I like doing the home and auto and the business part is I stay connected. Like I really yeah. like my clients are, you know, 
I feel like I'm a part of their business. That's why I want to be yeah. looked at as part of their business. So dealing with all the, all the different pieces of it, I get to know what's going on with their houses and their kids and their business and all that. And wherever I can help, then I want to be a resource for them. That's in nice. Regard. I like it. Thanks. Um, so you sort of touched on that because my next question was uh, like, what drives you and what motivates you to do what you do? That's a good question. Uh, my, my wife could probably answer that better than <laughs> me, but uh, I, I, what I, honestly, what it is, I like helping people. I like being, uh, I, I like helping people. Um, I've always been one of those guys that um, made sure people got home safe, uh, was an organizer. I'm involved in lots of things, like to be connected. And um, so I sort of fell into the brokering world, but I really like it. And I like being able to uh, to drive around and say, I know what's going on there and I know what's going on there. And that's one of my clients. Yeah. That's one of the places I insure. And uh, so I, it's very personal, a very personal business and it's fun. It's a relationship business yeah. and uh, I can provide a lot of give back, which is cool. Okay. And so I know you have a lot of experience in insurance, but you're newer to the brokerage owner situation. Yes. And uh, so because it's fresh, I wanted to ask you what surprises you about uh, running your own business? Uh, well, I had, this isn't my first time being Fair. an entrepreneur. Yes. So uh, some of the stuff I realized, but in this particular business, I think uh, um, the last business I was in, I was in an entertainment uh, role. Um, running a music company and what's different now in this business is how tech drives it. It's so mm -hmm. technology focused um, and all the pieces have to fit together. So for folks that are dealing in um, all the, the cyber issues and the True. information issues and the privacy issues and all those things, 20 years ago, that wasn't a big deal. Yeah. Right. I mean, we were, we were emailing, sure. but that's about all we were doing really. Yeah. Um, things have moved so far and the, and the web has come so far and all the, the data that's flowing back and forth. It's like, you're responsible for all that stuff. Yeah. And, um, I, we're just at the tip of the iceberg really in terms of understanding what that means. And, um, but that's what I find. There's just so much that we're uploading and downloading and, you know, people are looking for information and, you know, everything is digitized. And to that point, I mean, just having a, a cell phone in your hand these days, you've got a, a really serious computer here yep. that can hold millions of records. Yep. And as a business owner, if you have clients, you could be on the hook if, if anything happens with that. You're, you're responsible for that. That's you, ta all. you taught me this. I, hey, I, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm good at scaring people, I'm told. <laughs> well, I, I think that's part of your job. I think if it's, it's well, educating. It's, edu it's educating. Yeah. It's educating. And it's, it's making people aware because you're busy. Yeah. Like you're busy doing what you do. Sure. So you don't necessarily have time to digest all this other stuff. And uh, or know what's going on in the environment. So, so a big part of the role that I have is educational and to help people understand what they're responsible for, but also not just what they're responsible for, but what could happen if something goes wrong. So like you're saying what is the risk? Perfectly into my next question. Okay. Um, what what is something that most people don't know about your business, about the insurance world and, and brokerage business? Well, I would say about the broker brokerage business is that we're really here to help. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the other thing, I've got a, a co-op student that's working with me who doesn't know anything about insurance. So okay. for her, this is an eye opener. And what she told me, she didn't realize how customized things were. Mm, okay. She didn't realize um, how there's so many different kinds of insurance where it's not just really a one size fits all. Even sure. when it comes to home insurance. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you know, I live on a house. I live on a street where. Um, we've got, you know, 1920s and 30s houses. We've got lots of houses that have been renovated sure. and each one of those, if you just look at the address, they all look the same, sure. but when you actually look at the physical building, if something were to happen to that space, mm -hmm. how much you would need to replace a 2,400 square foot building versus a bungalow versus sure. a two story, it's Very all true. different. Yeah. And there is no one size fits all. It's, it's, it's really a custom, a custom fit business. So. That's a good I, point. I think she's, I think for her, that's like, that was a, that was a wow moment for, mm. for her. So I, and the questions I ask is something we ask a lot of questions and it's because we want to get it right. Right. So that when something goes wrong, it's not like, oh yeah, but we didn't do this or, oh, right. Sure. You didn't tell me that. It's good. The onus is on me to make sure that you, yeah. that, that, that we're covering all those things off and getting the, the program put together correctly. Makes sense. So something that you've uh, educated me about uh, over the last couple of years is, I'd asked you a number of years ago, why do why do rates keep going up? What's going on? 
and and you started talking to me and, and it seems like a lot of it is driven by um by weather uh, and natural on the property events. side on the property uh, side, yes, yes sorry I'm, yeah. I'm talking about property yeah. um could you could you explain in in 30 seconds how it is that what the heck's going on well um, I mean, let's leave the global warming debate aside. <laughs> yeah. So no, but there, if you look at if you look across Canada, um, there's just a there's been a lot of big incidents that have occurred, um, and uh, it used to be that it, it was pretty predictable what you could expect to happen in a year and, and a situation where it was only a a one in a ten year event or a one in a twenty five year event or one in a fifty year event, which it, it could be a, a storm or hail or or a flood or Natural whatever. Disaster. They didn't they didn't happen that often. And but if you look back over the past, you know, since two thousand ten, the number has just gone up between um, you know Alberta floods and the Don River flooding and a hailstorm and crazy snow and fires and, and this you know and... we had uh, you know. In our neighborhood, we had, you know, the power went out for three days. A lot of pipes burst when power goes yeah. out for three days. You have infrastructure issues that create problems, all kinds of stuff. Sure. Um, and all those things wind up being claims. Yeah. And so on the property side, what that does is, you know, the, you know, they say that, uh, you know, if the tide goes up, all the boats rise. Well, yeah. that's what's happening. And so from the company perspective, they're trying to figure out, okay, how do we uh, keep, continue to underwrite and provide more coverage for these risks? So when something happens you know, the clients are out of pocket, right. but at the same time, they need to collect more premium sure. to make the math work. Otherwise, companies will leave because they just can't make any money out of it. So you sound, let me go on down a different path for a second. You sounded right there for a minute. You sounded very insurance company friendly, but, but what I know about you, and maybe you can talk about this for a minute, is what is the role of a good insurance broker when there's a claim, you're not necessarily always best friends with the insurance company. No, right? no. I mean, I, I work for the client. I don't yeah. work for the company. I'm, I'm an advocate. And um, so the insurance companies are, well, there's two things on the, on the front end, when you're buying insurance, it's, you need to understand what you're actually getting because they are not all created equal mm -hmm. and you need to be aware of what you're paying for, what's not included, um, what's excluded, what the deductibles are, all those kind of things. Um, and, but on the back end, it's like some companies are easier to deal with on a claim. Okay. And so, you know, the ones that are easier to deal with, that tends to be reflected in their prices somewhere. So at the end of the day, um, and again, I'm not being company friendly, it's understanding what the policy is and getting the um, insurance company to do the right thing okay. and to do what they're contractually obligated to because it's a contract, but then also to look at the situation. And, um, you know, I was reading something last week where... You know, if you have a fire and all your records are gone, like you have no receipts anymore because they've sure. gone, pff, they've gone up in flames. Yeah. How do you actually <laughs> describe to the insurance company what you had? Yeah. And how or do they just say, okay, that's reasonable, or do they fight right. with you and, and say, show me proof? Yeah. Um, and uh, that's their right, but some deal with it better than others. And I and I think uh, from a customer service perspective and from a relationship perspective it's important for all the parties to work together so that the client who's paying the premium they've gone through a horrible situation like let's just do what we can to make the transition from point a to point b is sure as... um so so sometimes when you talk about insurance companies you know it sounds like you're almost being friendly towards them but i know from experience with you that um, if there's a claim or, or when you're looking to get the best or lowest possible premium and best coverage, you're not necessarily, you're not in bed with the insurance companies, right? No, no I'm, I'm looking to do the best for the client. And uh, so, you know, the nice thing about being a broker is you get a range of pricing and there's a range of, of, of product that goes along with it. Sure. So um, it's true that you get what you pay for, um, whether it's uh, the coverage, whether it's things that are included, things that are not included, that are excluded how claim servicing works and you know the, the key thing is when a claim occurs you want to make sure you've done your best to provide for every contingency for that a client might have sure. whether they know it or not yeah. i mean a lot of times they don't know it they don't know so it's my job to ensure that we've got the coverage there that they may never need until they need it yeah um, but then on the company side once the claim goes in um, is to is to monitor and make sure that um, the insurance company does what they're supposed to do and the, and, the, and the client is is happy with the process, understands the process, and is happy with the process and the resolution. So they get back to normal, whatever normal is, is as quickly as possible. So um, it's not just call 1-800 and hope for the best. It's right. with a broker involved, we can advocate on your behalf. 
So, so to make sure I understand properly, if I have a claim with my insurance company and I'm dealing with them and I feel like I hit a brick wall, it wouldn't be inappropriate for me to give you a call. Oh, and say, absolutely hey, not. No. Hey, can I you mean, help me out here? Maybe they, they're talking about stuff I don't understand. And well, that's our, that's our job. Our okay. job is to, is to, is to help you navigate the program and the process and ensure that the insurance company is living up to their end of the, of the, of the bargain. Okay. Um, and, uh, and by and large, I haven't had a lot of situations where there's been a problem. There's been some hiccups and sure. sometimes we've had to, um, have some conversations, um, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, but by and large, the, the companies are, are good and they want to do the right thing and make sure that and they, the clients are happy. Good to know. Um, so what would you, what do you think your customers uh, love the most about your business? About my business? Yeah. I mean, in a sense, you are your business. Yeah. Um, I think the fact that they can call me and ask for advice. Okay. Um, I, you know, I've done a lot of things, um, in my life outside of insurance, being an insurance broker. Um, and I'm very, I would say I'm very open and giving in terms of whatever I can do to help you, I'll help you. I'll connect you to people you may not need, you need to know, or sure. look at a situation is not just about providing an insurance policy, but if you're building your business, here's some things to think about. If you're buying a house, here's some things to think about that you might not have thought of sure. or vehicles or whatever, um, to have people give me a call in advance. The other thing is, is to shop. Don't just buy something. Yeah. It's like, actually let me do, let, let us do our job and provide you with some scope so that you can make sure you're you're getting the best value you can for whatever it is you're, you're looking for makes sense so so i heard a uh, an ad on the radio the other day one of those kind of got junk ads mm -hmm. and it was they were talking about the oddest requests you know somebody had five thousand cans of tuna that they needed to have removed on that vein what are some of the oddest requests you've had either just general client requests or odd requests to ensure an activity or a product anything come to mind well, I'm a, as you know, I'm a guitar guy. I, I like guitars and I, I had the opportunity once to somebody looking for coverage on a, a classic guitar and it was actually hard. I had to do a lot of work to try and find coverage for this vintage guitar mm. and it was tough. Really? Uh, yeah, it was I really hard. Thought. And, and well, guitar is one of those like one in a million kind of guitars. So okay. it was, <laughs> it was, but the, 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 the gentleman that owned it, he loved to play it, but when he, if he left his house with it, he felt like he was walking around with a target on his back. <laughs> sure. And so it, it was hard. And uh, I actually couldn't, I couldn't help him. I had to refer him to somebody else because it was such a specialty right. thing a specialized. that, that I, we didn't have access to it in our office. And again, that's the thing. You can insure almost everything. Um, it's just a question of, um, you know, is it really, is it so unique that even if you lost it, you couldn't get it back? Right. And that's an interesting conversation yeah. that you have with somebody. It's like, well, how would you replace that? Sure. So, I can, you know, if you have something that appreciates in value and you buy a piece of art and then the artist becomes famous, right? you didn't buy it for what it's worth. So yeah. now what, but what do you do now? You have this asset, do you insure it for what it is? Sure. Do you, it, yeah. How do you, how, how do you, how do you deal with that? Or, sure. or jewelry? I, we get situations where people, um, have jewelry collections or, um, for guys, uh, they'll buy a very expensive engagement ring and mm. not really realize what the implication of, the, of that is for insurance. Yeah. And we're having a conversation today and you know what we're shopping for is the best rates on the jewelry because that's the most expensive part of the policy. Really? And huh. it's like the companies all have different rates. So part of it is like understanding what's out there and what you can do to get the best, uh, uh, you know, the, the best possible solution for the, for the client. You made me think of something. So you work with um, uh, entrepreneurs. So somebody runs their own business mm -hmm. usually. And they're a human being. They have a personal life, potentially mm -hmm. kids, family, cars, yeah. home, etc. Uh, how often is everything packaged under with one company? How often is it split apart? And is it sometimes even uh, across more than just one or two insurance companies? Oh, it, it could be. It could be many, depending on really? what it. Yeah, okay. depending on what it is. Um, so if somebody's got a professional, well, just say they're they're, you know, some it's a a tech consulting sure. firm. So you might have, you need some professional liability. That's in one place. The property and the regular liability could be somewhere else. Could be packaged, could be separate. But a lot of those companies, especially companies, they don't do home and auto. So that you wind okay. up with a business policy and a personal policy. Yes. Um, and even if they all wind up in one, in one insurance home, it's not 
like you get a benefit when you bundle a home and auto. You don't necessarily get a benefit when you bundle uh -huh. home business and, and okay. things. So it's not always um, optimal to try to package it all with one company. It's really, again, whatever the client is doing, right. um, whatever they're trying to cover, what do we do to get the best solution for that particular thing? Makes so sense. sometimes it's very it's varied. Okay. There could be multiple things because, uh, you know, if you want something like legal expense insurance, for instance, which is coverage for legal fees, mm -hmm. um, there's only a couple of people to do that. Okay. So if you want to add that on, you can do it at standalone or you can do it as a package. Yeah. You know, there's all kinds of different different combinations and permutations. Gotcha. That. Okay. Um, so you've started a new business relatively recently. What are your goals for the, the first year? First year, um, I would like to uh, be, have a successful first year. Um, I'd like to uh, get to a point where I've got a staff of, of two to three in awesome. the first year, and I'd like to grow that to, uh, in five years, probably 10. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, clients, um, I'm looking to add a couple hundred clients this year on the personal side and the business side. Um, it's certainly achievable based on the relationships I've had over the, over the past year. Um, and really just uh, building the process and starting to recruit people to mm -hmm. be that have the same kind of vision and, and passion as I do for entrepreneurs and for how they live their lives. I mean, that's that's the toughest thing is finding people to get it. We'll have to have another conversation oh, yeah, about it. that because that's the challenge in my business too. <laughs> Always finding people who are qualified, motivated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think we might have just touched on, but I'll still ask you, uh, what are your greatest challenges in your business? Um, well, right now, I think that the biggest challenge is, is going from being a producer to being a, an owner manager. And sure. it's, uh, it's the, the um, compliance and understanding the, the rules and regulations around the business because there are a lot. And when you're, um, it's like being a sales rep for a company versus being a president for a company, you're a sales rep. Yeah, you're busy, you have sure. your budget, you're doing all your stuff. All, the, all, all that you need to do, but you don't have to look at the bigger picture. The buck doesn't stop with you. <laughs> right. So um, like any, any entrepreneur, you know, uh, you know, my, my co-op student starts at nine and finishes at five. Uh, I'm in the office at 7.30 and I'm in the office at 11. Yeah, you're right? going easy on her. Uh, get her, get in well, at eight she's good. She's good. <laughs> I have, she, when, I, when I need her, she's there. Sure. Um, but um, I don't want to get in trouble with her, with her co-op sponsors. Oh, yes, so, of course. Right? Um, but uh, but the thing is, like, you, you need to do what you need to do. Sure. Right? And uh, and I and that's not true for this business. It's true for any business. So, um, you know, I'm approachable. I do meetings on weekends and evenings. You just need to be... A, when. When people are available and they have the time, that's when you need to try and connect with them because this is there's enough detail in this that you need people to be able to think and not just try to give me the I mean ask for the least amount of information, just give me a quote. Sure. And because that's when things go can go sideways and they go bad. They go yeah. really, really bad. So you want to try and avoid that. Makes sense. Uh, so one or two more questions about sure. the business and then we'll get back to the neighborhood. Yep. Um can you think of a, a very memorable experience you've had with a customer? Uh, memorable in what? It's interesting. I, I had another uh, interview. He asked me that. So memorable can be good. It could be bad. So either you had a nightmare experience, uh, or you went through the trenches with somebody. Uh, or... Yeah, I, I've had I, I've had some different experiences. Okay. So uh, one was because uh, I live in a neighborhood where there's a lot of renovations happening, mm -hmm. and I've seen the bad side of when something goes wrong in a reno. Okay, it was which is very um, a very interesting situation to go through. So we had a a situation where a client was um, doing a renovation on a um, on a semi-detached house uh, he was had an underpinner in digging out the basement and uh, he was the building owner and he had a contractor that was insured we had checked all that kind of stuff okay um, the contractor was responsible for ensuring all the, the trades were insured and it just so happened that the underpinner on uh, uh, dug too far and created a, a wall collapse on an outside wall wow. and um, which is okay, this happens, but on a semi, like the house moves, right? Oy, oy, oy. So, um, so there was an issue. So that stopped work, everybody gets out and then everybody like then labor board comes Houses. in everything, <laughs> yeah, the city comes in everything. It just, it creates an issue. Yeah. Um, so, so that was fine. I mean, it happened, we move forward, everything's good. But then I found out that the, um, on the day of the incident, apparently the underpinners, it was just when his renewal was happening and things weren't straightforward. Oh, no. so yeah. So, um, it was going through, um, helping the client negotiate that 
process. Wow. And um, when I talked to the folks at the brokerage I was working at, I said, like, how many times this ever, like, have you guys ever been through this before? Yeah. And I said, nope, we've been in business for 30 years. This is the first time we've had one of these. So it's one of those situations where the probability is low. Yeah. But when something happens, the cost can be very high. Sure. And, you know, the easy thing to do is to um, just say, well, Mr. Customer, here's your insurance company claims adjuster. You guys work it out. Sure. Um, but this is the real, this is, you know, these kind of situations, the time that you can really add value and you yeah, can really sure. uh, shine. And so it, it became very interesting experience working through that whole dynamic with client. We wound up doing a lot of other business together. So, um, it, but it was very educational. Um, so, and when you, my hands are dirty, right? You see stuff that happens and it's like, okay, wow. Okay. I, I know you don't, you know, as a customer, you may never experience this. So all sure. the insurance is, it's just a cost sure. until you need it. And then all of a sudden you realize what the value is. Yeah. And so being able to share some of those experience to give people a sense of what if sure. is a good thing. On the flip side, um, uh, some of the things like I, I mentioned, I was in the entertainment space before and, and some of the, some of the things I enjoy doing is getting involved in, um, or participating in educational sessions and, uh, talking to um, artists and, and entrepreneurs about about their business and, and you know sharing some of my experience and here's what was good, bad, and ugly. Sure. And uh, to hopefully hope that they won't have to go through the yeah. same learning process that sure. I had to. Uh, so that's part of what I like and I do like to get out there and, and share share that uh, nice. information. So. so I know that that was all about your business. Now uh, let's talk about the this community that we both uh, that we both appreciate. Sure. I know you've lived just on the periphery and the boundary of, of Lee Side um, for a while. How long has it been? Yeah, uh, nineteen years. Nineteen years. Fantastic. Yep. yep. Seen a lot of changes in the neighborhood. That's for sure. Yeah, I bet. Um, what are what are some of the factors, or what attracted you to to the neighborhood? Um, I have to say the Morris Cody School District was a big factor, okay. even even back then. Um, we were living downtown in a in a condo, and uh, we were uh, pleasantly surprised to have a child that we were not expecting, which was <laughs> great. Um, and um, you know, a couple of years in, it's like okay, we need to find some space with some grass. Sure. Uh, we need we were looking for a lawn, and this is a great neighborhood. Um, it was convenient, um, and I don't think we appreciated how much we were going to. Uh, like being here uh, it's a very community oriented place we got involved uh, in scouting uh, in the neighborhood so i was uh, in, involved in scouting at out of st cuthbert's church for mm -hmm. you know 13 years so wow. i got to meet a lot of the families we were involved in the, in the school neighborhood and just get to know people um and uh i love it it's a great great part of the city and it, all of toronto like i I've, I've traveled to all parts of toronto yeah. and when people ask me from out from not from Toronto to ask me about the city, it's so big. It's like, well, it's, I look at it as a city of neighborhoods. Sure. It's, uh, true. it's like a quilt, it's very true. you know, and each, each, each patch of those patchwork quilts, they all kind of have their own design. They're all connected on the edges. So there's, there's, you know, a transition uh, area, but they all have a unique culture and they're all like little towns to me. Like yeah. all the neighborhoods I go into, it's all like its own, got its own little vibe. And I think that's so cool. So the, the Lee side patch yeah. of, of Toronto, what do you love the most about it? Um, I like uh, I like the restaurants. Mm -hmm. I like the the people. I like the cafes. I like the green space that we have. We have true. a lot of green space very true. Um, connecting in through the Don yeah, Valley and, and all and that. Yeah, and as a and as a, a scout person, um, one of the people one of the reasons people they ask they go, why are you doing scouting? It's like, well, we have so much green in the city, but we drive by it so much that so you need to stop and enjoy. look, and you get into the ravines and you realize that okay, you could be anywhere. Sure. And and you can really really get away, but you need to somebody to help you see that. Yeah, it's the forest and the trees. It's like, what do you see? Yeah, there's a parkette in our neighborhood, and and we did a uh, tree count with our beavers one time. Yeah, and we were shocked. I was shocked. There's like 30 different kinds of trees there. Huh. <laughs> and it's like I walked by that for years, sure. going, walking, you know, my son back to school, and you just don't think about it. So sure. you kind of zoom in and take a look and go, wow, this is really cool. Huh. So, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's just a great, it's a great spot. And, you know, people from uh, other the international visitors that we've had come here, they're surprised because yeah. when they think of Toronto, they think of a big city. Bustling. Yeah. And when they come here um, it, to this neighborhood, it's like, wow, this is, 
nice yeah. since the pace is different and we, you know, people know each other yeah. and they take care of each other. It, it's just, it's just really nice. It's, it's so, so you've been living on the, on the boundary of Lee's side and servicing Lee's side professionally for, for a long time. Yeah. So in 19 years, what are some of the biggest changes you've noticed about the community? The biggest changes, you know, um, the houses have changed. There's been a lot of role. I, you know, the biggest change is it's in, from the people perspective, it's no change. Okay. It's a, the same kind of families. It's a family yeah, uh, coming and going thing, but the family can only be so big before people move on. <laughs> sure. You know, so um, we don't have a lot of big families here, but it's a young community that, and people get really engaged yeah. here. Um, uh, some of the changes, there's definitely a lot more condo development happening. Um, I've been around long enough that I've seen a lot of the uh, the restaurants and stores start to, to change over. Turn over, yeah. Um, and uh, like, I'm going to date myself here, but <laughs> like when the longest yard on, on uh, Mount Pleasant first opened, uh, I played on their baseball team the very first year. That was a long time ago. Wow. I was renting in the neighborhood back then. That yeah. was before we moved here. Um, so when I was a first came to Toronto to work, I, I lived in the neighborhood as well uh, back then. So I'd seen lots of changes on Mount Pleasant, lots of changes on Bayview. Yeah. But overall, the vibe is the same. It's always been yeah. a good community vibe and it's just getting better. The There's more people in there. They like it. Is there anything you can think of that, that you'd like to see improved about the Leaside neighborhood? Uh, aside from the Eglinton being a, a, a parking lot with the darn <laughs> LRT construction, <laughs> Uh, that'll be good when it's done it'll be great it'll be great when it's done um to be honest the only thing i can think of is that we seem to have so much vehicle traffic and so many kids in the neighborhood and it's getting the commuter traffic is getting so hard that that people um aren't taking enough time to slow down sure and i just we had you know big snowstorm last week and the streets get so tight yeah. When there's a lot of snow. That's right. That is just, everybody just ease up. It's, that's, it's, that's... It's, fu- it's funny. I was frustrated on our street. We're, we're, we're in Leaside and yeah. uh, a snow plow came by and people are, some people, not many, but some yeah. people are throwing snow into the street and then it's getting pushed up against, you know, other people's driveway a little yeah. further down to the right of them. And, uh, and I actually remember my daughter and I spent an hour literally stubbornly digging out the parking spot in front of our house, yeah. which we don't need yeah. um, and throwing all that onto our lawn. Yeah. So now most lawns uh, are, are visible because mm-hmm. the snow is melted. Yeah. We still have snow yeah. on our lawn because oh, yeah. you're right. It's hard to pass it, by. And, it is. And, and uh, super super bowl weekend, um, uh, my son and our next door neighbor, I wasn't at home. Um, they were busy digging a trench so that just all the water, <laughs> the water could clear, clear out, yeah. right? And it, it's it's a lot of work yeah. to, to make that, but it just made a lot better and things certainly improved. But it was, I I always find it amusing when it snows because that's when you see the, all the neighbors. That's true. Everybody and comes everybody up to comes shovel, out of right? Their, so out of their hole. It's, it's like, okay, <laughs> this is such a Canadian thing. In fact, I took a photo of our street. Yeah. There was probably 20 people that I could see shoveling. <laughs> And I sent this to some friends in the UK. This is what it's like in Canada when it snows. And you're waving at each yeah. other. <laughs> That's funny. Um, all right. So uh, why do you think it's important for people to uh, to shop local or to use local service providers? I think it's important because it, it, what goes around comes around. It, it is, is, a, is a big part of it. And the other thing um, is um, it's just convenient. Like That's true. Why... Why hop in your car and drive somewhere if sure. you can, if you can walk? Yeah, let's stay away from downtown as much as it's, we can. Well, no, and, and it, it, but whether it's going to a box store mall sure. or you know, for the the amount of extra you're you're spending by hopping in the car and driving and parking and the t- your time, yeah, it's like pay the extra twenty cents for the the milk or the eggs or whatever it is at the corner grocer or you know go to the restaurant in your neighborhood or support the local folks because it, it just all it just really does all go around it's a good point um just to wrap up i'm going to put you on the spot and uh, ask you where your favorite place is to go in leaside do you have a few two top two or three um yeah satay on the road's favorite yes we need some thai excellent um i 
I sh my, my son would be all over me on this because he's been, I shop at uh, Value Mart a lot. Yes. Um, in fact, we've taken <laughs> our, we've taken our, our Cubs and our Beavers through a tour of the store, which is very interesting, <laughs> very interesting okay. for, for kids to see. We did a, we actually did a segment on what's in your neighborhood and uh -huh. we visited businesses Lovely. to see, just to see. So what happens in the back of a bakery? Sure. What happens? Like you see the front of the store in the street, yeah. but you don't really think about what's going on in the back. Yeah. And that was very eye opening for the, for, for the kids. That's neat. Um, so that was kind of cool. Um, I just, there, there's so much. It's, you can't I, choose. I can't, I can't, I, I can't. <laughs> I can't bagel house. I love the bagel house. Yeah. Um, all the, all the shops on Bayview is just, no, everything you mentioned was all food. Well, that's because I, like, <laughs> I eat there a lot. Um, but I just love the vibe. Yeah. No, that's a I good, the vibe. good point. So I'll let you off the hook on that, uh, or I'll stop, uh, uh, pestering you on that, uh, to wrap up, you know, I'm in real estate. Mm -hmm. Um, do you have any random questions or anything that you'd like to know about, uh, about the market, about the neighborhood, uh, anything like that? Well, I've had some inquiries about short-term rentals lately yes. and, uh, there's, th that's certainly a space that's growing and we're in a hot pocket for people. Like we're, we're a convenient place to, to, to be. Sure. So, um, you know, that's something are you seeing in this neighborhood? Are people starting to look to take advantage of that kind of uh, that's a, that's opportunity? A really interesting question. I actually haven't thought about it before now. Um, I know that as with many neighborhoods in, in the city of Toronto, or even GTA, um, their basements rented out yeah. longer term or, or medium term, short term, uh, kind of Airbnb style. I haven't had many of my clients mentioning that in the Leaside side area. Um, I do have to say, I suspect that my neighbors across the street, immediately across the street from me, uh, do sometimes, uh, uh, do short term rentals mm -hmm. because they're different cars and it'll be. For a week, I won't see my, my neighbors, but I'll see random new people that I've never seen before. So, I mean, it doesn't bother me. Yeah. Everybody seems nice. They yeah. still wave like a neighbor. Mm -hmm. It's that vibe, you know, yeah. that you yeah. mentioned. Yeah. Um, yeah, but not not a lot yet. Who knows? I mean, with regulation uh, coming down the line later this year in 2019, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll see if it's even possible. But it's certainly, we certainly don't have that, uh, that preponderance of, of short-term rentals that you're seeing in some condo neighborhoods yeah con very sure heavy for condo sure. neighborhoods but it's i mean but people are looking for i mean it is expensive like the city yeah. is getting more expensive right sure. so people are looking for ways to uh to help themselves out and that seems to be one so yeah. i mean i'm getting calls about it so i just oh, really? wonder whether you're seeing that yeah. same kind of thing oh very interesting yeah. chris i'm gonna let you go cool thank you so much for your time appreciate Good it to thank see you so much you Take bet care.